This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So Claire Rowan is an associate professor at the University of Warwick and editor of the Numismatic Chronicle, published by the Royal Numismatic Society. Um, and I've known Claire for quite a long time, I think since we were both graduate students, right? So yep. many years. And in that time, she has published a lot of work, a lot of articles, uh, several books. Uh, so her first book, which I have right here, wow. Divine Auspices, Divine Ideology and the Visualization of Imperial Power in the Severan Period, published by Cambridge. And then there's also this one, <laughs> from Caesar to Augustus, Using Coins as Sources, which is a, a part of the series that's jointly published by Cambridge University Press and the American Numismatic Society. And... Uh, more relevant to the topic she's talking about today, we have this one, uh, which is uh, co-edited um, by her Tokens, Culture, Connections, and Communities. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Claire. Oh, yes, and that one, that one, I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And the most recent one, which is the most relevant to the, today's talk, is Tokens and Social Life in Roman Imperial Italy, which is actually available for free online as a downloadable PDF. So you don't even need to pay if I inspire you enough about tokens. <laughs> so yeah, I thought I'd plug that one as well because it is free. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um, so I thought today, it being a Friday lunchtime lecture, um, I would kind of take a sort of light, uh, not a lighthearted, but a kind of fun uh, approach to looking at tokens. Let me just share my screen. Um, so essentially what I've been doing for the last few years now is looking at um, Roman tokens and what they can tell us. Um, and actually what they can tell us is enormous. Um, see the book. Um, but I thought what I could do today is actually just go through and highlight some of the things that tokens reveal um, and yeah, and then, and then kind of open it for questions. Um, so I've kind of called it the Roman world in 10 tokens. Um, that's because in essence, um, I've been collaborating with the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow, um, and we've put up an online exhibition um, entitled the Roman world in 10 tokens. Um, and so what I'm going to be looking at today um, is essentially tokens from that exhibition, um, but also then tokens that have the same things that are actually from the American Numismatic Society collection. So it's kind of like a Hunterian ANS uh, tour. Um, so if you're interested um, in looking at the exhibition, um, I've got the link there, but I'll also put it um, in the uh, chat. Um, so once you log on, if you click onto the related items um, session uh, section it will bring up the, the various relevant tokens it's quite a clunky system but i think as most museum creators know you are stuck with the system that you're given <laughs> so um yeah uh oh if i can change my powerpoint this would be good okay here we go um so yeah essentially uh, minimize that as well um so Roman tokens um, made out of kind of lead or bronze or aracalcum um, are quite similar, I think, uh, to tokens today. Um, so I've got an example up there of an ASDA token, um, which is something that is used in the UK. Um, when you go to the supermarket, um, they give the money you pay for the plastic bags to charity and you can vote for which charity you want. Um, and you are presented with a little token to do so. Um, and the tokens carry the name of the supermarket you might be shopping at. Um, if you're in New York, um, you might be kind of, well, maybe depending on age, uh, you may remember the New York subway tokens as well. Um, so these are objects that are kind of quite singular in a sense in that they're used for a singular purpose to make a vote or to, you know, one ride on the subway. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of singularity um, is also present, I think, um, with Roman tokens. So essentially, when I began the project, I mean, Roman tokens have essentially been almost forgotten. Um, so when they were dredging the Tiber in Rome um, to kind of build the walls to stop Rome flooding, they found thousands of tokens uh, in the river. Um, and from there, sort of, you know, various studies were made, the most probably uh, influential of which 
um, was Mikhail Rostovsev, um, who looked at them for his Abilitation Schrift. So this is kind of like a second PhD. Uh, he published a catalog in Latin um, as part of the project. Um, the, the, I've translated the Latin into English and it's now updated. Um, and so now we have a kind of a, a free database online with all the tokens on it. Um, Rostovsev also then kind of wrote a commentary in Russian on it for his Abilitation Schrift, part of which was translated into German. Um, and he kind of <laughs> laments actually, I guess his topic that he chose saying, I mean, my, he's like, my God, these objects, they're enigmatic. There's so many designs. I can't even tell what they were used for. And, you know, what, what I, I, you kind of got a sense of Rostovsev's um, regret. And he was saying, actually, we need to know how tokens are used in Athens, and then we can, we can know more about Rome. And um, so when I began the project, I kind of I myself didn't know anything about Roman tokens or even that they existed. Um, so I kind of picked up on Rostov uh, <laughs> um works, but I think actually what he was saying about tokens um, kind of reveals actually how they operate. They are quite enigmatic, um, but that's because everyone kind of who was using them knew what they were for. So an Asda token, if you're in the UK, you know what that's for, the New York City subway token, you know, people who are using it know what it's about. Um, so since Rostovsev actually, um, there's been a few studies um, and, and works. One, Bill Dazel is on the call, I think. Um, he's done some work on them. Um, but essentially, there hasn't been an enormous study of them since Rostovsev um, in 1903. Um, so what I've been doing is kind of bringing them back to life once more um, and bringing them into consciousness, like sort of public and scholarly consciousness. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today are tokens from Rome, the city of Rome, and Ostia. Um, and so generally they take the form of two types. Um, there are tokens struck in brass or bronze, um, and there are also tokens cast in lead. And I've got both examples there on the right. Um, they're from the Hunterian collection, a really nice portrait of Augustus above, um, and a winged caduceus below. So what we talk about today is kind of relevant to Rome and its port, um, but essentially tokens do exist elsewhere in the Roman Empire, but every kind of region or city that produced tokens produced them with their own unique style, their own unique designs, um, and their own kind of unique uses. So if we look at tokens across the Roman Empire, um, they really are kind of a very, very localized phenomenon. Um, and so what I say, Roman Ostia doesn't necessarily apply um, for other areas. Interestingly enough, um, some areas don't really seem to have tokens at all. Um, so as you might see from this map, the German frontier is quite uh, bare. Um, and Britain is quite, sort of doesn't have very many tokens at all either. And I think that's because essentially what I kind of concluded is that tokens are connected to euergotism. So kind of sponsoring banquets, uh, distributions, uh, entry, uh, sort of experiences in bathhouses, um, and probably this kind of level of euergotism or kind of public benefaction didn't exist or wasn't to the same kind of extent along the northern frontiers. Um, the most famous tokens, which you might have heard of before, are the so-called spintriae, um, and I have censored myself because I don't know who's on the call. Um, so if you are someone who is very easily offended by sexual imagery, um, or if there are any children online in the audience, now is the time to close your eyes as I reveal um, what spintriae show, um, which is sexual imagery, as you can see here. Um, the top one actually also involves a monkey. Um, that's what's underneath here. Um, okay, I'm going to sense them again. You can open your eyes if you're closing them. Um, so these are perhaps the best studied of Roman tokens um, for very obvious reasons, I imagine. And I think you can imagine as well. Um, but apart from these, there hasn't been a lot of work on them at all. Um, and although tokens do carry sexual imagery, they also carry a whole variety of other imagery as well. Um, you'll notice that the reverses have numbers on them. Um, that's very characteristic of these kind of early Julio-Claudian tokens. We don't know what the numbers are for. Um, we can have a debate about that uh, in, the, uh, in the 
questions afterwards, but it is kind of very characteristic of these types of objects. So the bronze and brass tokens were very like, well, they were struck um, and probably struck from dyes from very skilled engravers, um, as you can see from the, the kind of portrait of Augustus here. Um, the lead tokens were cast from moulds. Um, so the moulds were generally made out of palombino marble, which is a very soft marble that you can carve. Um, and you would carve one half of the mould, the other half of the mould, put it together um, and fill it with lead. Um, and you get something like the result um, here, which was something that was excavated at Ostia and clearly had been discarded as something that didn't quite work out. <laughs> um, I should say, so lead has a very soft, or not soft, low melting point. Um, and it's also very clearly distinguishable from coinage. Um, it's cheaper to acquire. And so it's clear then that we're talking about production that was quite distributed, actually. We find these molds, um, normally just one half, um, in throughout different regions in Rome and Ostia. So the casting and everything is really distributed. It's not one workshop. So having kind of had this brief introduction to Roman tokens, um, I'm just going to now look at things that they tell us. And this is not going to be exhaustive because they can tell us a lot, um, but hopefully it will kind of show you what we can learn from tokens, what tokens can offer us. <clears throat> um, and the first thing is uh, essentially they offer us a really interesting insight um, into the imperial image. Um, so this is particularly the case for the Julio-Claudian period um, where we find a lot of representations not only of the emperors, but of the broader imperial family as well. Um, over time, the representation of the emperor does seem to decline on tokens, um, and we can debate the reasons for that as well. Um, so what I've got here as a kind of sample for you um, is one of these uh, bronze tokens that shows actually Augustus um, with his wife Livia, um, kind of it's almost like an album image, uh, Dugate. Um, and it's kind of fascinating because this is obviously a product made in Rome at a very skilled workshop, even perhaps the Roman Mint or, or someone who has worked at the Roman Mint as a dye engraver. But of course, Augustus never struck coins with Livia on them. It was only under Tiberius that Livia appears. Um, but so here we find that on other media tokens, um, we get a much broader representation of the imperial family as a whole. Um, and so kind of minor members of the imperial family, babies that were just born. Um, and so it shows us then this really kind of fascinating image into how the, the broader imperial family was represented in Rome. Um, and so while perhaps the imperial government was responsible for some tokens, um, the vast majority of them would have been kind of sponsored um, or had the authority of someone other than the imperial government. So a magistrate or a private individual um, could go and get tokens essentially with the portrait of Augustus on them. And so this might be the case here that it was Augustus and Livia. Um, in the ANS collection, um, there's a lovely lead token that shows Germanicus. Um, so again, one of these um, individuals who doesn't necessarily appear um, on kind of imperial coinage, but we find represented here on the lead token. Um, with a rather lovely laurel wreath, I have to say, um, and a military trophy as well. <clears throat> so these are rather lovely um, images of the emperor. Um, but what tokens also give us are what I will call bad portraits. Um, this is a portrait of Nero, believe it or not. Um, and you don't just have to kind of take my word for it. Um, we can see the writing around the, at the outside of the portrait actually reads Nero Caesar. I don't think we would be able to identify this as Nero otherwise. Um, interestingly, on the other side, we have, it's either Mars um, or a soldier. Mars standing in this way hasn't actually appeared on Roman coins yet. So again, this is kind of a forerunner um, of what will come. Um, it's only kind of later. Um, that Mars appears like this. Um, and the legend reads Claudio, um, which is this reference actually to Nero as a member of kind of the Claudian family. But again, an iteration that doesn't appear on coinage at all. 
So clearly, I think we can all agree, this is not kind of an official imperial product. This is clearly something made by a private individual or association. Um, and we just have this really bad portrait of Nero on it. Um, but when we read our texts, actually, um, it seems that these bad portraits were quite common. Um, so one example of this is uh, Fronto, who was the tutor of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Um, <clears throat> They kind of had a bromance going for quite a while, and there's a lot of letters between them. My students love to study them. Um, but in one of these letters, um, Fronto writes to Marcus Aurelius, and he says, you know, how at all the money changes tables and in the booths, the shops, the colonnades, the entrance courts and windows, everywhere, your images are on display to the crowds. They are quite badly painted, and many of them are sculpted and carved by heavy-handed, or more probably talentless artists. Um, but Fronto, in this great bromance, says like, well, even though you look nothing like you, I nonetheless, when I go by, I go, you know. Um, we also have another example um, of the one of, an author writing to Hadrian saying, oh, I'm, I'm here at the Black Sea. There is a statue of you. It looks nothing like you. Perhaps we should do something about that. And so I think in the surviving record, it's really hard to spot these bad images that these authors mention. Um, but tokens do offer us this kind of insight because they do have the name of the emperor on them. And so we can begin to see the many ways um, that the imperial family is kind of conceptualized and visualized on different types of media and by different um, uh, types, of, types of groups, in essence. <clears throat> Um, just to kind of emphasize the point about kind of varying productivity and varying kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, aesthetics. Um, so some tokens are really beautiful and some are, yes, well, stick figures. Um, so here is an elephant with a mahout, an elephant, uh, an elephant rider. I mean, I probably actually couldn't do any better than this, I'll say that. Um, but you can clearly begin to see the different styles we have at work. Um, which probably represents just different people engraving those molds. Um, on the other side of this, we have the uh, an abbreviation org, so a reference to Augustus. Um, we don't know which emperor this was, but again, sort of individuals creating imagery and associations that we may not necessarily find on other imperial media, um, but which shows how the image of the emperor really was kind of conceptualized in many different ways by many different people. Um, there are some, I mean, you might have already realized, but there are some very obvious references to coinage um, in the design of the tokens and the way you've got a portrait with a legend going around. Um, I will say that none of the tokens actually directly imitate a coin. Um, so they're clearly trying to avoid charges of forgery. Um, it's probably also why they're using lead. Um, but there is clear reference to coinage, um, you know, and there's this eternal debate that numismatists receive from people outside numismatics who even looked at coins anyway. Um, I think tokens are probably one of the strongest pieces of evidence to say, well, they did. And clearly coinage had a, an impact um, on the mentality of the Roman people. Um, so this is a token from the Flavian dynasty. Um, we have the Emperor Vespasian um, <clears throat> on side A. Um, and then we have Titus and Domitian facing each other on the other side. Um, and this clearly references a known coin type from the period, which shows the exact same image. But there are interesting differences. Um, on the coin, both Titus and Domitian are bareheaded. I mean, they're not your, you know, emperors yet. But if you look on the token, both Titus and Domitian have laurel wreaths. Um, so something has gone on here. Um, and there's this wonderfully placed imp above both their heads. And the ambiguity here suggests that not only Titus, but Domitian um, is being given the title Imperator. Um, and so whoever, whatever group that this token was made for, it's gone beyond official imperial ideology but clearly they would have been receptive to it, I think. Um, but yes, a very interesting case. 
Um, other references we find on tokens are to games and festivals. And so we find a lot of imagery connected to that. I've got one example um, which shows the head of Juno Suspita. Um, so this is a particular version of Juno um, from Levu Le uh, Lanuvium, just kind of outside Rome, who's kind of characterized by having a goat skin headdress. Um, there's a kind of sculpture of her there. Um, interestingly, on the other side, you have spectators um, who, are, who are in the process of applauding. Um, and this is another fascinating thing about tokens. Quite often, the imagery on the token is a representation of the person who's going to be using the token. So we find examples of cult worshippers and here audience members. And clearly, this is something meant to be used amongst an audience. Um, <clears throat> Um, and what we know these tokens were used kind of in spectacles and theatres, we'll look at some texts in a minute, um, but by putting on kind of a representation of two individuals applauding, there's this subtle sense that you should, you too shall be encouraged to applaud at this event, whether the tokens are distributed before the event or during the event, it's this idea, this subtle working of you will applaud. Um, and I think it kind of is this really great insight into kind of, let's say the anxiety that the Romans must have had when putting on games. Like what if you put on games and no one applauds or the crowd riots? I mean, the unpredictability of the crowd is a common theme in texts. Um, so for example, um, we find Suetonius in his life of Nero says that actually when Nero was performing in the theater, he got together a whole bunch of equestrians and plebeians and he got them to master all types of different applause. And so that whenever he performed, they would begin applauding. And so everyone else would probably be like, oh, oh, we applaud here at this point, like a provocation. Um, and this is kind of, I think this token is like a material manifestation of the same idea. Please do applaud. So they act um, on the user. <clears throat> so how do we know that tokens were used at various events? Um, we have some really fun texts in Marshall. He's a satirist um, and he basically writes a lot of cutting jibes at various people, um, but they're quite informative actually. Um, so we have this particular section where he's talking about a knight is given <clears throat> 10 tokens. So nomismata, in Latin, this is like a coin-like object. Um, <clears throat> but he's like, you've been given 10 tokens, but you've taken 20 drinks. So the idea is you would exchange a token for a drink at the event. Um, and this Sextilianus, who appears to be quite the drinker, um, is Marshall returns to him in a later, in a later epigram, saying, You drink as on your own as much as for five rows. You ask for bronze tokens, the nomismata. Um, it doesn't have to be bronze, it doesn't say bronze there, not only neighboring ones from people sitting with you from, but from blocks further off. So this Sextilianus being like, oh, you're going to use that token, you're going to use that token, you're going to use that token. Um, so during some sort of event, then like, you know, this is how kind of, let's say drinks were managed and distributed. Um, in Cassius Dio talking about Agrippa um, as Adile, so in, responsible for putting on events in the theater, um, Dio tells us that, um, and we have several references to this, so this is clearly something that happened in the theatre quite regularly. At a certain moment in the theatre, um, Agrippa threw symbola, um, which is the Greek word for tokens, hurled them into the crowd, um, some good for money, some good for clothes, and so everyone goes scrambling to try and get a token to exchange for a product. Seneca talks about this moment in the theatre and he says, at this point, the sensible man leaves. Um, so one can only imagine what it was like. Um, we've also got a reference to Dyer talking about Titus at the Colosseum, um, where he doesn't use the word symbola, so tokens, but they clearly what he's describing is a token, um, but of wood actually, which if they ever existed, do not survive. Um, although we do have tokens of clay um, and other materials. So little wooden balls inscribed, again, hurled into the crowd um, to get gifts. <clears throat> We've also got, as I mentioned on tokens, a lot of imagery connected um, to the games. Um, so these ones, again, I'm gonna say not 
imperial products, but clearly the products of more modest individuals, perhaps holding more modest gains or benefactions associated with gains. Um, so here we have a bestiarius, so a kind of the individual who's responsible for fighting animals and a boar on the other side. And he's actually got the spear. Um, and if you flip it, it's kind of like he's chasing the boar. Um, a lion, um, if you have to take my word for it if you don't believe it. Um, on one side, um, on the other side, um, the, the words PR. And PR is probably just the initials of a name, actually. Um, and whoever was giving out these tokens, everyone clearly knew who PR was. So there was no need to actually explain or spell out um, the image or the authority like we find on coins. So coins really take great pains, actually, particularly Roman ones, to spell out the emperor, to spell out the design. Tokens don't do that because they're for use from, I guess, for a very closed group for people who already know the individual and the context and authority is obvious. <clears throat> um, yeah, and so in addition to kind of pick up on this idea, um, I mentioned that so we have uh, audience members shown, but we've also got worshippers shown um, in various cults. So again, it's this idea that as a user, you're meant to identify yourself in the image. Uh, this is one example from the ANS collection uh, with three women doing this. Um, traditionally, this has been identified as uh, Hecate, um, but it's not really how Hecate is. Um, a woman standing with arms raised is, is a pose of, of worship, actually. Um, and that's what we've got here. And sometimes you find just one woman, sometimes you find two. Here it just happens to be three. Um, so again, some sort of context where a female user of the token is meant to identify themselves in the image. This is a worshipping context. Um, again, on the other side, probably a reference to a name, an abbreviation, um, and it probably stands for a Claudius Maximus. <clears throat> We've also got tokens that encourage people to chant. Um, so there is a bronze token type that exists um, that carries the chant yo yo triumphe um, and this is the chant that was chanted by soldiers as they went through the streets of rome um, as part of the great ceremonial triumph where kind of all the booty and the captives from a particular campaign would be displayed the emperor would come through or the soldiers would come through and they would all be shouting at the same time um so this chant is enca encapsulated on the token again probably provoking people to to speak, to chant um, as one. The design is a laurel branch. Um, and on the other side, what looks like horseshoes are in fact not horseshoes. Um, these are, are miller, so armbands um, that were given to soldiers um, who did well uh, on the battlefield and a talk as well. Um, so these are military honors um, that were given to soldiers. And you can see from the tombstone I've included here, you've got the talks on the shoulders. Um, and the armbands as well. So it's, it's a, again, a representation of kind of a triumphing soldier. It's not the emperor who's shown the triumphator. It's the person who's kind of in the procession who might be expected to sort of receive these uh, benefits. Um, we don't know if this was actually used in a triumph or not. Um, it could have been used in another context, but then evoking um, the whole kind of paraphernalia of the triumph. Because tokens were used, I think, in a lot of festival contexts where there's merriment and kind of, you know, a break from reality. And we do have some rather fabulous uh, imagery, which I think is meant to, you know, evoke laughter and fun. Um, so this is one of my favorite tokens, which shows a triumphator, um, but not a proper emperor because the, the, the triumphing emperor or individual um, is in his chariot, but on a camel um, and he's being crowned by a monkey. I um, mean, this is particularly hilarious because essentially what would happen during a triumph is a slave would stand behind and say and whisper in the person's ear, holding over the, you know, the wreath saying, remember, you are human. Um, and if you think about that and then think, well, a monkey is doing it here. Um, it's quite hilarious. Um, so there is a lot of satire and fun happening, actually, um, on Roman tokens that I think are connected um, to their in essence, you know, festival merriment contexts. This is another one of my favorite ones. This is one from the BNF, um, where we've got essentially um, some builders 
Um, <clears throat> and you can see the crane here. Um, I've included a relief um, from a tomb of builders to show um, what a Roman crane would kind of look like in terms of construction. And essentially, in a moment of joy, someone's on the crane and his two mates are lifting him up and he's going for a big swing. Um, and you can see it beautifully captured here, in essence. Um, so this sense of joy, um, of fun, of festivals. <clears throat> in the ANS collection, um, there's one token that might be satire, um, although like most of these uh, artifacts, it's kind of hard to pin down. Um, but We've got a male bust um, with the name Olympianus around, and on the other side, another name, Eucarpus. So they've made this token together. Um, and they give the sum of 1,000 sesterci, which is not a huge amount of money, but it is a significant amount of money, and certainly not one lead token size. Um, so is this kind of a joke money? Um, 1,000 sesterci, ha ha ha, tiny lead token. Um, perhaps to be used at the Saturnalia or something like this. Um, we don't know, in all honesty. Um, another idea might be that they've made some donation to a, a group um, or an association, 1,000 sesterci in, in some, but for that type of donation, it's quite small, actually. <laughs> we also get this wonderful kind of interaction with statuary and other kind of famous buildings and monuments. Um, so, again, you might have to take my word for it, but here we have what I would call the stick figure Venus. Um, and you can kind of see she's kind of covering herself. Um, and it's a reference to a very famous statue type of Venus getting out of the bath and being like, oh, and not quite managing. Um, but clearly, whoever is making this token, it's clearly an important kind of statue type that actually they can reference very easily via stick form, um, you know. Um, and so to see how these types of statues are kind of interacted with um, and how they're used in different contexts and by different groups is another way we can use tokens um, to think differently about the Roman world. On the other side, we have Fortuna, um, who's very popular on Roman tokens. I think because, you know, festivals and, and fun contexts, banqueting, it's a nice image. But also if we think that some tokens were hurled into the air for a mad scramble, Fortuna no doubt has some sort of influence on whether you get a prize or not. Yeah. Um, so tokens could be made by individuals. Um, they might also be made by associations. Um, so this is a very interesting token um, that's in the Hunterian um, that carries the legend Antinoi. Um, and I suspect this is probably a reference to a cultic group who worships Antinous, um, Hadrian's deceased lover. Lovely portrait of him there. Um, we know that at Lanuvium there was a kind of association that worshipped both Diana and Antinous. Um, and so this token may not have been made by the same association, I'm not saying that, but a, probably a very different association that was also kind of connected to the worship of Antinous. Um, and here we have Fortuna, um, on the other side. In the ANS collection, um, you, there's a really great token, again, uh, issued by an association, a, a sodale, as they call themselves, um, that carries on the other side a, a radiant head of Nerva. Um, so this is the deified Nerva. Um, so probably this is a token issued by a group that was dedicated to the worship of Nerva or was perhaps celebrating the anniversary of his death or some sort of festival connected with him. Tokens are also really useful in terms of uncovering, yeah, like different types of workers and groups that may not necessarily be well preserved elsewhere. Um, so one of the groups that shows up on both bronze and lead tokens are the Sakari. Um, and these are individuals who kind of just basically, they were dock workers. They went onto ships. They carried off all the, the goods, um, you know. Um, and we have little statues of them. Um, I've got an example here. They're kind of found all throughout Ostia, the port town. Um, they're here represented on a very kind of heroic looking relief nude carrying their amphora um, off the ship. Um, and again, represented nude in a very heroic fashion on this token, um, 
which has on the other side a sex scene. So close your eyes now if you're easily offended. All right, the red dot is back up. Um, but this very interesting, yeah, so in a sense, people who have studied the Sakari, they were traditionally sort of just being poor dock workers, but actually they were quite wealthy, um, particularly those who kind of managed um, the workers. And they, you know, clearly here, I think what we're getting is groups of the Sakari creating tokens um, for use among themselves, in essence, um, with this very heroic vision um, of the dock worker. Yeah. Um, in terms of individuals, I've just put two examples here. So sometimes we have the names spelt out, which is lovely. Um, most of the time we do not. Most of the individual names we come across are not known otherwise. Maybe one or two um, we might know as magistrates, but the vast majority of them are otherwise unknown. Um, so here in this uh, specimen from the Hunterian, um, we've got the name well, the abbreviation of the name Olympi, so it could be an Olympios, a male, it could be an Olympia, a female, um, women did issue tokens as well. Um, and here we have what I am thinking is like some sort of squid, um, but I'm happy to be corrected on that. This is a unique specimen, it's the only one known, um, and as you can see, it's not in the greatest condition. I, I think I, in the catalogue I safely just said crustacean. Um, um, and the other kind of approach we have is just basically putting your initials. Um, so this specimen in the ANS just has on each side ACH, ACH, um, which is a fascinating insight actually into how kind of everyday Latin operated. I mean, clearly ACH was enough that people knew who it was. And you think, well, the group can't be that big then. Um, but the kind of fascinating parallel actually is all the election slogans we have from Pompeii. So in Pompeii, people would kind of write on the sides of uh, walls and everything saying vote for so-and-so, vote for so-and-so in the forthcoming elections. Um, but quite often it's just an abbreviation like L-U-R. Um, or here I've put an example like A-R, vote for A-R. And clearly everyone knew enough to know that this was all as rustius. Um, so we find this same sort of abbreviation um, on, on tokens. And I think it shows, yeah, a very interesting insight into, yeah, like levels of literacy as well. Like were individuals able across multiple kind of groups, able to recognize particular letters um, and kind of, yeah, be able to read them. <laughs> um, so the dating of tokens, they begin really in earnest under the Augustan period. Um, and continue all the way into late antiquity. Um, and I'll say for the majority of tokens, we can't date them. Um, they're largely found in fill contexts, um, which is not useful. Um, and we only ever have them, particularly lead ones, in one or two specimens, because the idea of a token is that you're going to hand it in to get whatever you're entitled to. And so the ones that survive in the archaeological record are ones that people have accidentally dropped, or which for some reason like never fulfilled their life course. I presume once they were handed in, they were just melted back down again and, and different tokens issued going forward. Um, so the lead tokens kind of continue into the third century. Um, they do kind of then transform. They're not produced in the same quantity as in the earlier imperial period, but we do get bronze tokens in late antiquity. Um, which are being very well studied at the moment by Christian Mondello, actually, and I've plundered some of the images from him. In late antiquity, um, the, the tokens are kind of connected to the festival of Isis, um, and yeah, so we have the representation of, again, both male and female worshippers. Um, so essentially, if you were kind of a priestess of Isis, you would actually dress up as Isis during the festival, carrying the sistrum and the citula, the sacred bucket, if you were um, a priest of, you know, the, the Egyptian cults, you would also you would dress up as the as Anubis, the jackal-headed god, and wear a mask and everything. And that's what's represented here. And this festival is is associated with the opening of the Salim season, um, which is very obvious from this um, picture of Isis on a boat. Um, so we have a lot of tokens kind of issued for that. 
We also have lead tokens connected to the same cult from an earlier period. So there is a kind of continuity there that this particular festival and cult does seem to have its fair share of tokens. Um, as we move into late antiquity, other types of groups begin to make tokens. Um, so Christian groups, for example, um, or this example of kind of a scribe or, or gospel um, reader um, on this particular token here. <clears throat> Um, and tokens really continue until the fall of Rome. Um, so this specimen that's in the Hunterian, um, I've got a nicer example on the right-hand side from the Munzkabinet of Berlin, um, shows what tokens look like really in very, very late antiquity, so 5th and 6th centuries AD. Um, so you can see these tokens are very different to what we've looked at before. Um, in this period, essentially, they're kind of made out of bronze, and they would hand etch the writing and then inlay it with silver. Um, so this is not a cheap cast lead object anymore. This is quite an expensive item. Um, <clears throat> these tokens are all, in essence, kind of um, <clears throat> uh, connected to kind of uh, the elite in Rome. Um, they're often labeled as coin weights, coin weights, in fact, but they're definitely not coin weights. Um, they often carry, they kind of carry very similar um, legends. There's often a reference to the health of the emperor, so here in Salvus, um, and there's always this legend to kind of um, repairs or renovations, completions, reparavets, um, and so they were thought to be kind of um, by Dressel, who kind of came across them when he was doing the, the CIL, the Catalog of Inscriptions. Um, he thought that maybe there was some sort of building dedication, but they're very small, like tiny things. Um, and so the other suggestion maybe is then these are mementos given at events where they are kind of dedicating a building that someone has rebuilt. Um, and they are, I would say, pretty much all the names on them are from um consuls or praetorian prefects so high officials in rome in late antiquity um so there might be mementos that were given out and one of the most recent studies suggests that perhaps there were tickets to the uh, the events you know kind of um marking the the renovation completion uh, produced at unjustifiably high expense um because it's all hand done there's silver here um so this particular token um, was made by one Anicius Faustus Albinus Basile Basilius, um, who was consul in 541 BC. Um, and when Rome falls to the barbarians in 546 BC, he flees to Constantinople. So this is really the fall of Rome. And Basilius is the last ordinary consul of Rome. Um, and so how do we understand these types of tokens? I think the idea that it's an invitation or a memento at unjustifiably high expense um, is actually probably correct um, because what Basilius and other urban kind of elites did in late antiquity was they also, of course, produced um, ivory diptychs, um, which are hand engraved, also very expensive items. And again, the studies of these items suggest that they are essentially mementos that were kind of sent out when individuals were holding their games um, as part of their, their office. Um, and so having kind of a small object inlaid with silver is still, I would argue, probably cheaper than an ivory diptych. Um, but it kind of reflects the changes in how Roman society operated in that the, the elite was spending a lot of money on these types of gifts. Um, you know, it became kind of a, a cultural development that they made these very small, small portable elite ornamental items. Um, so really right up until the fall of Rome, um, we have uh, tokens. Um, <clears throat> and Rome in late antiquity did require quite a lot of rebuilding <laughs> um, as continually things fell down and were sacked. Um, so as I mentioned, we do have quite a few of these items as well this is just kind of the last one probably um yeah before rome as we might recognize it um falls so to kind of sum up uh this whirlwind tour um of tokens 
Um, essentially, yeah, they, they offer this insight, I think glimpses really into individuals, um, into groups that we don't necessarily otherwise have actually um, in our sources that survive from antiquity. It also offers us glimpses into moments, to emotions, um, you know, kind of moments in time in a sense. I have shown you a very small selection um, here, and there are thousands of designs actually from Rome and Ostia. Um, so really the diversity um, is, is extraordinary. Um, and I think, I hope with the talk and with the book and with everything else, I think it would be, you know, just to remind people, I mean, we still have actually tokens today. Um, and, you know, ancient civilizations began with tokens, we had the invention of money, but now of course we've gone back to tokens with our chip and pin cards um, and things like that. Um, and we do kind of have them in our daily life, even though we may not pay attention to them. And I think that's kind of, um, yeah, a takeaway to think about, yeah, these small unassuming lead objects actually probably did a lot of work in antiquity, um, just like tokens do today. Um, so I mentioned that we had a, a database um, that a lot of people have contributed to. It's not yet finalized because every hour I turn, there are more tokens. Um, but there are quite a lot on there that will give you uh, a, a sort of a sampling, in essence, um, of what tokens were in Rome and Ostia. Um, I also decided to end the lecture with another one of my favorite tokens, to which I must give a nod to Bill Dazelle. Um, which is the oyster token, um, which shows an oyster, um, and on the other word, the Latin for oyster um, in a wreath. Um, so yeah, um, go and explore tokens, um, and I hope they bring you as much joy as they bring me. Um, and I will leave that there. Well, thank you very much, Claire, for that uh, rich lecture and certainly something uh, a bit different than what we're accustomed to on our long tables, which are coins and medals. And now we've got some ancient tokens, which I think is probably the first uh, long table on this. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to open it up uh, for questions. Please unmute yourself and ask uh, questions if you have any. I see there are two in the chat. Should I answer those ones? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so for David, the, the applauding one, how do you know they're not engaged in some ritual act? It is true. I mean, it does seem a bit kind of odd, but I think the, the applause ones um, are also kind of only, they appear when there's gladiators um, and when there's kind of more spectacle scenes. So the one I showed was for Juno Suspita, um, but the other type suggested is about games. But of course, games could be held in the context of cults and festivals, religious festivals. So that I would say that's probably what it is. It's a some sort of festival for Juno Suspita, um, or perhaps even the token issuer is from the Nuvium and decide to put Juno Suspita on there. Um, but I think it, it definitely, the other types of gladiators and beasts and things does suggest that this is um, probably a spectacle that they're applauding, yeah. Uh, thank you. I I didn't know how people applauded in the Roman Empire. It's really I, I, rare. Like well, I was I, looking everywhere for images of applause, and it's super rare, actually. I have to say. <laughs> um, I, I do have a quick question. I don't think you addressed it, and if you did, I apologize. No, right. And then I'll, I'll I'll cede the floor. But since you just started with that one, um, do we have any knowledge about interest or regulation on the part of the Roman government uh, of tokens? Um, because sometimes municipalities kind of put out things that are somewhere between local coinages and tokens. Uh, sometimes they have very interesting, like the gnome coinages of Egypt, which are not quite tokens, but then again, uh, I guess they're coins. You know, it, it's a bit of a spectrum there. But what what do we know about uh, Roman authorities' either awareness, tolerance, or crackdown, or caring in any way about this sort of um, you know, coin pool on the on the down low. Um, yeah, I, in all honesty, I don't think they ever operated in any way as coins, not even emergency coins. So they're never found um, in purses or, or, or deposited with coins, whereas we have like pseudo coins and things that were clearly acting as coins when they're not really coins. And they're hoarded and stored and kind of clearly all there together. 
Um, but these never are. So I think it's super clear that these are not coins. And so I think the lead demonstrates that. And the ones that are made out of brass or bronze, the imagery is so crazy, like with the numbers or the sex scenes that no one is mistaking this for, for a coin. Um, so I think you could make, anyone could make tokens and they were then, I think, for these distribution contexts or within kind of private groups, like maybe you want to invite some friends to a banquet um, or something like that. So, or that's, but they didn't, clearly didn't have any regulation or, or, or worry about it. Um, in Egypt, they also had tokens, which are very, very different, actually. Um, so you mentioned the gnome coins. In Egypt, there are tokens, but they're more civic in nature, actually. They name Oxyrhynchus, they name Memphis. Um, it's a very different on Antinopolis. Um, so however tokens are being used there, it's in a completely different way. And so everywhere that kind of tokens sprang up, it's different in each case, which is weird. So no one appeared to be talking or influenced by each other. Um, so that's kind of fascinating as well. And there are cities that never issued tokens. So Palmyra is quite famous for tokens that are made out of clay and terracotta. But neighboring kind of Jury Ropos, the kind of military um, settlement, doesn't have. What was the Greek and Latin word for token? So Greek symbol. Oh, symbol, um, right. And it's very clear in Greek. It's very nice, very straightforward. We can all move on. In Latin, it's more complicated. They use a variety of words. So nomismata. Um, sometimes they use tesserae, but tesserae can also mean other things, of course. Um, and I'm trying to think what the other word was. Yeah, it's it's kind of they use it in Latin. There's a whole bunch of words actually, which is why I didn't I don't have a Latin word for. It. I just call them tokens. I think that's easier. And in the world of online databases, you do not want to be typing in tessera into a museum catalog because there'll be a million mosaic pieces coming at you. Um, so yeah, but clearly there was no. I don't think there was any concern um, by the government or with the creation of these pieces. So yeah. Uh, my, my name is Jim McClellan, and I've done some work on uh, early modern French tokens beginning in the, the 12th century, and they have many of these same sort of functions. But there's no evidence in the Roman world of them using as counting pieces on counting tables or anything like that, which is where the French ones began. Yeah, I mean... It's manual arithmetic. So it has been suggested that the bronze ones in particular may have been counting pieces, but it just seems that the archaeological record doesn't suggest it. They're kind of just individual single finds. They're mm -hmm. never together, which seems quite odd. Um, so, yeah, no, I don't, I mean, I don't think the evidence is there that these are the counting pieces. The Romans had probably counting pieces, but maybe I think that was something else. Um, Thank you. Terrific. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful talk. No, thanks. <laughs> Bill suggests a cuttlefish. Yeah, I gotta get my crustacean knowledge up. <laughs> yeah, a cuttlefish would be a good idea, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I think someone has their hand up. I can see it. I, yeah, um, just go. <laughs> um, hi, Claire. How are you doing? I um. I, so this is a question that's sort of um, particular to, to some tokens I've um, dealt with in the past, which is well, my knowledge of tokens is limited. Um, but so I were going to dig where we have some tokens that only have imagery on one side. And I'm wondering how common that is. And if you have any kind of explanation for what reasoning they might have for only doing an image on one side rather than on both. Yeah. Is this in Italy or somewhere else? In Italy, yeah. Okay, there are tokens that have only one side. Um, it's they're more common in Athens and Ephesus and that to have one side, but they they do exist. Um, and it could just be maybe you only want to pay to, or maybe you only want to engrave one side. <laughs> it could be that there's one because when you think about the casting, if it's cast, um, lead. the ones that we have are lead. Yeah, the lead, but sometimes the lead is struck as well. Very rarely, very, very rarely. So this might be one where if you look closely, it is a, a struck one. Um, the majority are cast, um, but they're, they're definitely doing this. They're, they're much rarer. Um, and why you would only have one side? I don't know. <laughs> um, design choice. Or maybe like from the, the mold too, because you have to remember the mold could produce several different designs at once and actually several different shapes at once. So maybe someone also just forgot to fill in one of the holes on the mold. And 
you know, several were produced without, and the rest of them all had designs on both sides. Um, so that's also kind of a possibility as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't be clearer on that, but yeah. <laughs> Um, so Bill in the chat is applauding the use of the Oyster token. Um, so how do you interpret Marshall? Yeah, so is this the one where Marshall talks about, oh yeah, Marshall actually makes a lot of references to leads, actually, the plombeos, um, which traditionally have been interpreted by those who are translating Marshall, who did not know about tokens, um, as kind of like quadrantes or very cheap coins. Um, but I think he is actually referring to, um, lead tokens I think he refers to them actually more than people realize in his work I think he makes a lot of reference to them because I think actually they really fit the themes of his work um in that his whole idea is like taking huge things and just making them really tiny and quite token-like actually um and so I think that kind of and he's really kind of anti-consumerism and, and this like that so I think he really does make use of tokens in his work and because he also complains about being paid in plumbeos in lead um, by his uh, patron and um, and people have said oh well they're just saying uh, he's really you know he's he's complaining he doesn't get enough money um, but actually he's probably making a reference that he's being paid in tokens which actually makes him more indentured as a poet you, at least even with like cheap coins you can go and buy things wherever but if you've given a token you can only use it then on perhaps the estate of your patron or something like that so you actually even have less choice and even more indentured so as Marshall presents himself um, than others. So I think he actually uses it a lot. And I think now that kind of tokens are coming back into consciousness, it would be really interesting to see how kind of Latin specialists, which I'm not, but how they can reinterpret um, how Marshall has been read to date. Um, in terms of the next frontiers of Roman tokens, yes, yeah, so I'm hoping to do some more work on the Ephesus tokens um, for which there is uh, already a catalogue, which you know, Bill, um, but there's a lot more out there. Um, and with the excavations that have been happening in Ephesus and stuff, there are actually fine contexts, which I'm sure are all still fill contexts. Um, but yeah, to kind of think about what they show and what's going on there. Um, I'm still, as I mentioned, finding tokens from Merriman Ostia all over the place. Um, so I just keep adding things on. Um, I'd also like, and I'm trying to work on looking at the female token issuers a bit more, um, but it's very hard to kind of, yes, yeah, say anything because you just have these female names and much like the male names, we don't really know anything about them. Um, and looking at them, the tokens aren't any different from the male ones. I'm like, oh, is there actually anything to say there? I don't know. <laughs> I was doubting myself earlier today. So, yes. <laughs> There was one other question in the chat um, about spintriae, mm. um, often called brothel tokens, but the consensus seems to be that they were gaming pieces. And the question is, is what is the current understanding? The current understanding is we have no idea in all honesty. Um, so yeah, they're definitely not brothel tokens. Um, they could be gaming pieces, um, but other things we know are gaming pieces have been found as a set. And these have never been found as a set, which could just be like a fluke of archaeology. Um, but I'm kind of suspicious that they're always just found as individual pieces. Um, one suggestion which I do wonder at is maybe they were actually used in a lottery. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, emperors throwing things into the crowd, like this could also be something like that where the numbers represent different um yeah, items. So essentially, though, I mean, although the spintriae are die connected to all, like the, that bronze, brass, Julio Claudian tokens, they all seem to be really tightly die connected, actually. So the obverses all change, but the, the use of the numbers stays the same. So there's clearly some sort of workshop where people are repeatedly going to get tokens made and they're changing the obverse designs, but keeping the numbers, actually. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of yeah um so i don't i i i really don't think it's a board game it's possibly a lottery um situation but yeah i mean we do also find numbers on lead tokens and sexual scenes on lead tokens um so clearly they're part of the, the same phenomenon 
actually. Um, and we would never think that the lead pieces are gaming pieces. So I think that could all sort of also kind of discounts against the idea that they're, they're, they're gaming pieces. But I don't honestly have a, a definitive <laughs> solution for them. Um, but I say we have to see the spin as part of this much broader context. As I say, they're all, they're all die connected, um, including the ones that are struck by a magistrate of the youth. So, um, so clearly, you know, um, and the, as I say, the Sicarius type is also die linked into the spin so it's clearly a workshop that's working over many, many years, actually, because um, we've both got the living Augustus and the deified Augustus. So clearly continuing <laughs> um, uh, in that period. So, yeah, sorry, I couldn't be more definitive. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, so someone said the bathhouse. Yeah, the ba the famous bathhouse in Pompeii where the lockers have numbers and there are sex scenes above each number so you, you know exactly where you left your toga so to speak um so there has been a, a suggestion too that they're connected to that um in terms of yeah kind of a lot like i guess something like 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 check tokens i guess or something like that but we have no evidence um kind of written evidence that this type of thing operated that you would have kind of a hand in your toga get a get a ticket sort of thing um so yeah and i think Sexual imagery is actually also like quite um quite widespread. But yeah, there is definitely one in Pompeii. And people have made that connection before. Um, but yeah, I don't know where you go beyond that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Claire, again for a great presentation. We really appreciate it.